Hello everyone, I'm here with Matt Donald, uh, local pump and grower, local legend. Anyway, <laughs> this video is going to be, I know a lot of you guys on, on my channel are have a little bit of piece of property and you like playing in the dirt and using your hands and finding ways to make a uh, profit. So in this video, Matt's going to talk about recommendations he would give if you wanted to start a patch at your place, invite people out for agritourism and some things that might be successful, some things to think about and make it profitable and hopefully enjoyable. So enjoy. Okay, Matt, this is what my viewers want to know. We all have a piece of property. We want to, uh, we're hobby farmers. We want to make a little profit off of it. If we have five acres or something in that range and we want to have a small pumpkin patch, what do we need to do to be successful? Like varieties and parking and all the other things that go with it. What do we have to say? Yeah, that's very good question. It's a, a, an exciting question to kind of think about and ponder and answer for you. Um, I've done some research kind of ahead of time a little bit for this question, and I, I have uh, some thoughts to provide you with. And my, my, first, my first thought, my first point would be set expectations. And what I mean by that is when you think about how you're going to use your property and what you want to do with your property, uh, think about scalability. Think about um, how much work do you want to do? How much of your property do you want to use? How big is your homestead? How big is your driveway? How is the county road that goes by you, your location? Those kinds of questions like that. So I would say uh, one of the keys to talking about making a successful pumpkin patch on maybe five acres is basically, first of all, setting those expectations for yourself, for your family, uh, for potential customers down the road, you know, what can you handle? What do you want to handle? And do you want to go from smaller to medium to bigger? Or do you want to just maybe stay on the smaller scale, you know, roadside stand kind of thing um, with produce, for example? So that's my first point. My, my second point would be to a successful pumpkin patch would be um, consider identifying a niche for yourself. Um, there's a lot of people out there that do many, many cool things. Lots of pumpkin patches, for example. But what is it that makes you want to go to their pumpkin patch down the street, right? What, what is it that they do that makes it really, really exciting and, and inviting? And for us at the Patch and Woodland, we found our niche is actually pumpkins, just pumpkins, straight up. Um, we started really, really small. We've gotten bigger, of course, over the years, but if you boil it down to what we do still the most, it's growing pumpkins, and people still come to see us even after going to other farms because they want to come buy their pumpkins. So I would say consider a niche being a very important part of kind of starting up a successful pumpkin patch venture. Um, also, consider how you're selling your, your pumpkins. So... You could do you pick, you could do uh, picked for bins, you could do roadside stand, um, things like that. And what we found is the, the kind of the bread and butter for us has been kind of a mix of the two with the biggest though still being the you pick because people want to get out of their car typically. They want to go into the field, experience the dirt, you know, pick the pumpkin for the kids and all that stuff. But we offer also the bins and so we're able to carefully watch over our special varieties by putting those in bins, picking them ourselves, and having the public pick the more typical carving pumpkins. With the exception of the polar bear, because the polar bear pumpkin, the white pumpkin, is so popular, people will literally run from their car at different times to go get them. So if they know we have them, they're a hot commodity. But by all means, consider uh, a niche being a very important part of your venture. It's, it's critical for you standing out. It, it's great for web presence, being on social media, things that you can talk about that make you different, um, how you advertise basically. So that's point number two. Uh, point number three for a successful pumpkin patch, maybe on five acres would be uh, your farming setup. Um, again, consider your homestead, how big is your yard, your driveway, your shop, the county road, wherever you have around you. Um, think about things like, where will you get your water from? Do you have water? Do you have to have water rights? Um, think about the trees on your property, the shade, because with pumpkins, for example, we found that the shade is not good for pumpkins to grow. We have to give up 
though we love the oak trees that we have, they actually hurt us on the production greatly. And so we have to be very careful about that. They also require a lot more water by the trees <laughs> for pretty obvious reasons. So just make sure that you kind of assess, you know, your farming setup. Do you have the equipment that you need? Um, do you have the ability to be able to go to the store quickly for something that you need, you know, for your farm? Things like that, you know. Um, just be thinking about how your farm is set up. And again, um, kind of on the idea of having people come to your property, can you handle people coming to your property? <laughs> Do you want them to come to your beautiful property? Because we've known farms over the years, they have the best intentions, they open up for the first or second season, they find that the public basically runs them over because of vehicles and people parking and people walking. Even my yard this year, my backyard, has a deadbeat path built into it basically because people's feet were all in the same place with a string and I hope to have it come back next year. So you have to think about are you willing to give up some of your property for people to be able to actually use it. Those are good points. While you're at it, um, we, we ran into this as Chris, Christmas trees. We had some taller trees next to our trees and they aren't growing as full in there and the trees are affecting your pumpkins how many hours of shade can they take or do they need full sun all day long? Oh yeah, We've, we would basically tell people that they can handle some shade, maybe a quarter of the day, but, and it, it's, a, it's a blessing in the heat of the day if it works out that way, I guess. <laughs> uh, it doesn't work that way in the real world. So we found that we actually leave a buffer around our trees so that we know they're not gonna grow. We don't waste our time, the irrigation, the tractor hitting the branches and those kinds of things. Um, yes, pumpkins do like full sun, but again, on those super hot days, shade can be a blessing and also to go work in that with your own body out there. So, um, but by all means, it makes for nice pictures in the end of the season too for the harvest season. So it's a blessing and also a curse. Um, but oh, in, in general, your pumpkins can do okay around trees, just not right up close tight to them they can handle some shade. Uh, my, my fourth point on considering how to have a successful pumpkin patch on maybe five acres would be consider your parking. <laughs> it sounds simple and it is simple, but it's not that simple when the weather gets you by surprise. And when a farm like us that has nice big open fields around us gives those to a parking lot, what we have is also mud when it rains. <laughs> And we've had things happen over the years where people have gotten their vehicles stuck. Um, they've basically not been able to leave the field at all. People lock their keys in their car all the time. Uh, people park in the wrong places. Consider having a parking attendant or attendants. This season, we actually even put up parking partitions. We, we use pieces of orange netting with, with a steel posts. And that really helped direct the flow of traffic in our parking lot. So, um, I mentioned earlier that we've probably given about five to seven acres of a field um, for parking. And on the busiest busy days, you have to have available parking. And so if you're on a tight county road, for example, with a small driveway, you might talk to your neighbor. You might you know, configure a different kind of a setup for yourself you know, to have people not park in your actual driveway or on your property. But you have to be safe, talk to the county, uh, that you live in, uh, consider a crosswalk from across the street, things like that. And we've also found you have to have things like, you know, road cones, um, orange vests, um, flags, you know, signage. You have to think ahead because the parking can become your worst nemesis on a busy weekend when you're very, very busy and you find out you have a catastrophe happening in your parking lot and you have to go over there and take care of that catastrophe, and you spend two hours doing that, <laughs> and car after car is getting stuck, um, it's not much fun. So by all means, consider on your property if you can handle cars coming to see you and parking um, in a way that makes sense for flow and safety and all those things like that. My, my fifth thought or point for a successful pumpkin patch, maybe on five acres, would be consider growing multiple varieties of pumpkins. So rather than growing a single variety and putting all your eggs in one basket, think about maybe, you know, three, four, five, six varieties the first go around. You know, try some different things out. Um, see how your soil does the first time or the second time. Um, consider your customers, you know, 
People love to buy carving pumpkins, but when they see that you've got a bright orange and striped, you know, nice decorative pumpkin, they go, oh, I want to have one of those too, <laughs> or gourds. And so you can really kind of leverage, you know, kind of a basic thing like an orange pumpkin to really help yourself out. So consider maybe, maybe that being kind of how you start out is, is not just trying a single variety, um, but also knowing that you can't plant them super close together and you might have some crop failure where they come together. So because of cross pollination. So give us one, two, three pumpkins in order. If you could only plant three pumpkins, which three varieties would you plant? If I could only plant three pumpkins, the three varieties I would plant would absolutely be the, the F1 rocket carving pumpkin, the F1 polar bear pumpkin, first gen F1. The polar bears are beautiful. They're large and white. And I would also plant the uh, Snowball F1. So two white pumpkins, one orange pumpkin. <laughs> Believe it or not, the white pumpkins are the thing. And you can make snowmen in your yard or on your porch with them in the wintertime. So people will stack the white pumpkins and they'll last for three months for the holidays. I never, thought <laughs> never think about that kind of thing. So yeah, so the Snowball, the little mini white ones, um, the, the F1 rocket, beautiful orange carving pumpkin, and the large, very large polar bear white pumpkin. Those are my three I'd grow. So what you talk about the snowball being smaller, the, the rocket, what's the standard size? You know, just the average size of that carving yeah. pumpkin? Yeah, an average size carving pumpkin is about 14 to 17 pounds for us. Maybe more like 12 to 14 for others. Nice green stem. Stands about a foot, foot and a half tall, maybe, maybe almost two. We're, but we're also on the larger side. <laughs> Our farm is known for having bigger carving pumpkins. Um, we, we have over 20 pounds each. So yeah, in, in general, figure about 12 to 15 to 17 pounds for a nice carving pumpkin. Funny enough, people also like to carve the little mini ones. And they'll even carve the small snowballs. So. They're all different options, but we topped out around 70 varieties again this year. So <laughs> there's all kinds that you can get for your pumpkin patch. Okay, now the challenging topic. You ready? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> my, my six uh, tip or thought on growing a successful pumpkin patch, maybe with five acres, would be consider having a supplier that can help you out on the side with more pumpkins. So if you have five acres, and let's say that you have a house and a driveway and a shop and a nice yard, maybe you have three acres of your property left. And that's if you don't have a bunch of trees on your property too. So let's say you have three acres of property and you wanna have a pumpkin patch. Okay, of that three acres, let's say you give an acre of that property to use for parking or something like that, or maybe your stand or your bin area. So you have about two acres of your property left, let's just say hypothetically. What that means is your actual growing um, area of your property is quite small in the grand scheme of things. And so you're not gonna be able to get that many pumpkins out of your actual property. If you wanna scale larger, you have to bring pumpkins into your property when you've already sold the first round that you had. So you can continue to make more money and have customers come back and see you. So, when I think about maybe a five acre pumpkin patch, for example, or maybe six or seven or eight acres, I think about very quickly how small that actually becomes in the grand scheme of your setup if you account for the public coming to your actual property and parking their vehicle there. Um, so my advice would be consider making some connections locally with people around you, other farmers, where maybe you grow pumpkins someplace else, maybe you buy somebody else's pumpkins, and you bring them to your property to make your pumpkin patch be sustainable past maybe a weekend or two. Just to give you an idea, um, on a busy weekend for us, we can clear three to four acres of pumpkins, easy. So when I think about like a two acre patch, you know, it's not so busy the first year or two, but as you get bigger and get busier, you're going to sell those pumpkins very quickly. And just to give you an idea, uh, maybe a really rough number. Um, let's say you had uh, five full acres of really nice pumpkins with no crop loss, and you sold those for a great rate. 
um, to the public, wholesale you pick, you could probably figure to make maybe around $40,000 all said and done. Don't forget about your expenses, how you had to grow them, had to buy the seeds and all that stuff. But basically at the end of the day, you might net, you know, maybe let's say $35,000, maybe 30,000, something like that, which is pretty nice. But again, do you want to stop there or do you want to get bigger? And you have to make those decisions. So I would really encourage people to consider making connections. And we've done this for several years where we have to bring in somebody else's pumpkins to make our patch keep going. Uh, on that note, while you're talking about that, uh, I didn't even think about people bringing in pumpkins until one time I was looking at a friend's Instagram post there in Colorado. And they said, we went out to get our pumpkin and I looked at their post, there was no pumpkin <laughs> plants, vines, anywhere. It was literally a hay field. They had some bales of hay, some corn stalks that they propped up in there. It was a cow pasture that had been grazed down. Nothing growing. And then pumpkins just set out everywhere and people went out and picked up their pumpkins. And I thought, you know, I, I'd like to have at least a few plants out there and the pumpkins mixed in there, but people were happy to do it. Yeah, this is a, a topic that comes up every year for us too. We we talk about people's experience, you know, they, they like to see basically like literally farm to table. You know, you literally walk out in the field, you see or you take your pumpkin from the vine, take it home with you. It's an, an experience. There are people that will use even like their yard or a grass field and you can certainly do that. And it's it's very easy to place a pumpkin in something like that too. But just consider that, you know, if you, if you use grass, for example, what are the pictures like for people? When they come out to get their pumpkin, are they having a fall experience or is it more like they came to your yard, they got a pumpkin from a pile and it was like, hey, nice to see you, nice to meet you, you know, thank you, and they leave. Or are they really enjoying the farm experience? And so by all means, uh, we would say consider, you know, having some plants to start with at least. And as, this, as the month plays out for October, for example, we always have the vines go away. It happens every year. People are very understanding of that. And we'll, we'll just place somebody else's pumpkins from a truck, for example, by our old vines. And you can't tell the difference typically for pictures and all that stuff. But yeah, by all means, I mean, we had somebody one year contact us and they kind of like Christmas trees, they went by a gas station on a freeway off ramp and they were peddling pumpkins. And, and I mean, all the power to them, That's a, it's a cool idea, but you're not gonna have the experience of any kind of a farm feel by peddling them by a gas station by the freeway. So, but again, you know, that person paid us some money, they took our pumpkins, and then they upped the price a little bit from what they paid us, and then they made some money that way. But for their time spent, probably not very much money <laughs> at the grand, grand scheme of things. So uh, yeah, people do this all the time, you, you can do it, but I, I'd recommend having at least a few plants to start out so you can kind of have some kind of an experience for people when they show up. My, my seventh point for a successful pumpkin patch on, on five or six acres would be consider the labor. Think about the work um, to be successful. And not to go off topic here too much with this one, but we've been doing this as a side job for our, for our last several years of our lives. And I, I work a regular office job and then I do the pumpkins on, with my dad on the side. So we're changing our clothes after going to the office. You know, I'm coming over to the farm, getting dirty, when nobody cares about pumpkins, you know, it's, it's uh, May, June, July, you're, you're talking about kayaking, mountain biking, you know, going to the beach, vacationing, and we're talking about pumpkins. I mean, who cares, right? So you have to really think through to be, to be successful at this. Okay, what does that mean for me personally, you know, my home life? And um, I want to encourage you that you can do this. Uh, it's a great workout program. We lose 20 pounds a season, each of us easily, my dad and I, it's, it's a great way to work out, but you will spend a lot of time in your field, um, even on a, in a small field. <laughs> so, and I also have a large garden, so I go from pumpkins to gardening. <laughs> my hands are all over, but I mean, in all reality, one of the, the things that you have to fight with is your labor. And it's one thing to grow and to have your, your um, growing season play out, but then you have to think about the harvest season. So. 
You know, if you have a, a smaller patch, you could probably have family and friends help you get through maybe the first few years. But as maybe you get bigger, you can't handle it anymore. There's too many things to do. And just, I mean, to give you an, an idea, the, the preparations for us take us about two solid weeks of our own time. I take vacation from my regular job every year and I do preparation with my dad. So you have to be willing to give a lot of effort to make it happen. And it, it feels great when you see the end results, but you also see the losses. You see the hot weather, the mice, the worms. I mean, you, rabbits eating your pumpkins and squash, all kinds of weird stuff. So you have to be able to figure out that labor. Can you handle that? And uh, with our harvest season now, we've got over 30 people helping us. <laughs> 35 people. We've even had to use a staffing company to have people be hired through so that we're basically, we have like an employee through a staffing company that we're paying for to handle the amount of labor that we have. Because friends and family can't do enough anymore. I'm gonna to add to that right now. Uh, I'm going to probably, as a Christmas tree farmer, I have done you know our Christmas tree farm for the last 20 years. I was younger and it was smaller and Barry and I did the work. And then I have four strong boys that are excellent workers and they helped. The sad thing is my boys have all graduated high school and they are moving on. And the biggest challenge that we, my business partner and I are talking about, because his two sons have graduated, moved on, is you know I have a couple at home right now, but a couple more that are leaving this next month, moving on with their adult life. It's like, how are we gonna keep working? We're getting older and our boys are moving on. And uh, my biggest concern on the Christmas tree farm is finding skilled labor. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they need on the pumpkin patch. I know that there's skills and everything, but to shear a good Christmas tree and have somebody give you the angles that you want and the straight edges and to have to go and teach someone new and then find out this person just can't do it. Um, anyway. I know this is a pumpkin video, but uh, whether any type of egg, people don't want to work in the field these days. Um, and so, you know, how long are you going to have family members that want to do it and where can you find it? I have an advantage at being a school teacher because I at least know good young men that are workers and can follow directions. Um, I've been blessed just because I'm a school teacher, uh, being able to find some people, but uh, you, you better find a way to find people to help work your field if you're going to grow. And that was perfect, Rob. Yeah, that's it's so key. It's a huge deal. It, it drives us crazy on the coordinating. Yeah. So to wrap up, uh, how I think you can have a successful five acre, six acre, seven acre pumpkin patch. I have a couple of thoughts to kind of kick over to you to kind of consider. Um, they're kind of interesting. They're different things to think about, but they're, they're really big deals. So for example, um, you're going to have an event at your property, right? You're going to have a harvest event. And so you think, well, what if somebody gets out of their car, they trip and they fall on my driveway? What's gonna happen? Okay, insurance, right? You have to have event insurance. And so we found over the years, you not only have to have event insurance, but know what the event insurance covers. Be very careful about that. So, you know, you can open up your property and have the public come see you, but don't forget that you are ultimately liable on your property and you want to be very careful. You know, you have the best intentions. So we actually reach out, uh, we, get, we get event insurance every year um, for the pumpkin patch. And it's been very, very important to have that, you know, running along beside us because when you get 50,000 people, for example, out here, we actually had two medical emergencies happen this year. We had to have the ambulance come out twice. Um, during our event. And so, I mean, things happen all the time, especially with a, a very large parking lot. <laughs> um, consider how you set your business up. You know, uh, are you a legitimate business? Are you self-employed? Are you like just doing hobby farming? You know, are you an LLC? I mean, consider kind of what, uh, what you want to be. You know, do you want to have a name? Do you want to be a farm? farm to table? Do you want to join a local, you know, chapter with your county? Something, do you want to make it a bigger deal? So just be thinking about, you know, in terms of uh, what is this business? Is it just like on the side, you know, extra cash? 
Is it much more than that? You know, do it the right way. Cross all your T's, dot all your I's. You know, talk to the right people to make sure that you know you're doing it right. Um, and especially be careful, you know, if you have lots of people helping you, um, I would again recommend a staffing company because a staffing company is like a flash in the pan to help you. You know, you're doing a couple weekends. You don't want to go hire people full fledged. You can do it the right way through a staffing company and you pay your bill and they get paid that way and you're done. And so it's a nice a little avenue to use. But be thinking about, you know, that what do you want this to be as you as you start out? And, you know, if you're going to start really small, you might not know that for a while. And you can kind of test the waters. Um, but yeah, by all means, if you want to get bigger, think about the actual business aspect of it. And I, I would say uh, another key thing to a successful um, pumpkin patch is how much of your own money do you want to invest in, in this venture? And not just on the business side, but, you know, let's say you have some fun money and you have to go out and spend, you know, a couple thousand dollars on good pumpkin seeds, that can feel pretty hard. I mean, you know, back in the springtime or in the wintertime, you're kind of like, why am I doing this? I'm buying pumpkin seeds, you know, in bulk, and I'm dropping $2,000 for, you know, for the mail to come to me. And then you get them in the mail, and you're like, oh, great, put them on the shelf. You know, there's $2,000, and they aren't even grown. You haven't seen the weather. You haven't seen how you're going to feel, you know, in August yourself, you know, how your equipment's going to be. So just be thinking about in terms of your own finances on your own property. Are you willing to invest maybe a few thousand dollars and then like, you know, your electricity, you know, your, your water, those kinds of things, you know, gasoline, diesel. Can you do that fertilizer? Can you do that and feel good not having anything back in return until late in the year? Um, when people come to your property. So yeah, we're, we're around 27 or so acres. Uh, we, yeah, I, I mean, being fully transparent, we probably dropped over five grand in seeds, uh, maybe closer to six, all said and done. So it doesn't sound like that much in the grand scheme of the size of our farm, but when you're doing that in the winter time and you're using your hard earned money that you don't want to use for the next season seeds, it's, it's pretty challenging. And the suppliers run out of seeds like May timeframe. So be very careful <laughs> not to wait too long and try to buy them like when it's planting time, because you can hardly get them Excellent. if you can get them. Yeah. And I had one last comment to make. And lastly, uh, this is a, a really challenging thing to wrap your head around sometimes too with a pumpkin patch, but kind of on the labor side of things and, and you're working, when do you want to be open? You know, do you want to be a weekend pumpkin patch? Do you want to be a weekday pumpkin patch? Do you want to be a seven day a week pumpkin patch? We've been the seven day pumpkin patch experience for the, our whole existence. And it's a blessing and a curse because you can never recuperate in a month. It's, it's like a track meet, like running a marathon. You, <laughs> when it starts, it doesn't end till the end of October. And then we have cleanup after that. So be thinking about, uh, when you think about your pumpkin patch, be thinking about, well, what am I willing to work? What, what kind of hour should we be open? You know, if you're gonna start small and only do weekends, it might be a good move for the first couple of years because you can make your crop sustain your customers. If you're gonna be big, you're gonna be open seven days a week, you know, okay, by all means, have a contact that you can buy pumpkins from to bring to your pumpkin patch because you're gonna sell them out pretty fast. So be thinking about, you know, what, what hours, what days and dates do you wanna work? And then make sure that you, you um, make that very clear to the public because people don't read very well sometimes and they show up thinking that you're opened or you're closed and it's a very, very big issue. And Google, we, we love, everybody loves Google, right? Great tool. They always seem to get our business hours incorrect, especially for a seasonal business. We talk to them on the phone, they call us, and people come out to our farm and go, why are you not open at like 8 a.m. versus 9 a.m.? Well, because they saw it incorrectly online or something like that. So be mindful of how you also advertise what you're willing to be open. All right, uh, everyone, I want to thank Matt Donald. Uh, to be honest, I know some of his family more than Matt. Uh, 
but uh, the whole family is great. And uh, but Matt's a good community member, and he's been generous to share his time with me. So thank you very much, Matt. And if you judge a man by his kids, his daughter has gone through Meyer School. She's wonderful. They got more coming. So he's got a good family, and he's got a good farm out here. So thank you very much. And thanks for joining me on the Flanagan Homestead, where Christmas trees are my business, teaching, including horticulture, is my job, and outdoor projects are my passion. Be blessed, everyone. Hope to see you again soon.